As always, we like to start with samples, and I am glad you brought that in Ooh. because my entire landscape is crawling with that. That's too bad. I know it. <laughs> and all these insects have to have their opportunity. It might take 20, 30 years, but some of them will peak about every 20, 30 years. Uh, I want to show this because this could be easily mistaken <coughs> for uh, maybe a uh, an active invading mildew of some kind, right, Amy? Oh, yeah. And you look at this, and this happens to be purple coneflower, but I've seen this on a number of different plants, and right, in your mm -hmm. landscape, and that's because this is a plant hopper called a citrus plant hopper. You know, we don't have citrus in Nebraska, but regardless, it was probably named because it was first discovered on citrus. But a citrus plant hopper, the nymphs are, uh, secrete a fuzzy material, kind of like mealy bugs do, and uh, as they feed, that's some protection for them. And uh, I think the camera showed that there was an adult down there, unless it flew off. But the adult is kind of wedge-shaped, mm -hmm. and uh, right you'll there. see those feeding on the plant as well. But none of these, you know, when you look at them at first, you think, oh, no, something's going on. Is it progressive? Yeah, there it is right there on this side. See there, right there. Okay, but uh, these aren't really harmful. Uh, maybe in real high numbers, you said that you had some uh, portions of the plant above where they were feeding starting right. to yellow or wilt. And if that's the case, uh, you know, you can go ahead and give them a big blast of the, of the garden hose, you know, set at jet spray or something like that. But otherwise, you know, they just happen to be reaching peak numbers this particular year, perhaps because of the weather or something. And that's just a manifestation, a piercing sucking insect. <coughs> and plant hoppers, this is citrus plant hopper, there's a few other species too. But they all kind of look the same with that fuzzy stuff around the stems where they feed. So excellent to know it is an insect instead of a rot or a spot. Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Because if it were a rot or some kind of fungus, you'd probably say, oh no, it's going to envelop it real soon. And right. <laughs> you'd have Thanks, to do something Jim. about it, right? All right, Zach, a plant out of place. A plant out of place, yes. Get the poison email ready. Uh, we have uh, milkweed today, and uh, I look better with this in front of me, but uh, milkweed, it is, uh, it's a perennial, and uh, many people, uh, it's really, in many ways, it's not considered a weed, and weeds are, are, are defined as a plant out of place, and a lot of it's subjective, but uh, these are wonderful for pollinators, particular, uh, particularly butterflies. Monarchs. Monarchs wow. especially, and so in lots of prairie type settings, uh, people love those. Uh, the problem with these is they, they spread by rhizomes and they can get uh, a really thick stand. And so uh, golf course roughs, uh, no mow golf course roughs have become a real problem because it interferes with play. And so it again depends on the setting. It can be a weed. Uh, some people don't think it's a weed. And so it just depends on, on, your, on your viewpoint. It gets its name from the, the, the milky sap. And uh, controlling it is really difficult. Roundup is about the only good way to control this. If you, if you choose to control it, uh, a regular mowing might help. It's a really difficult one to control. And that's probably one of the reasons why most times we just leave it for the pollinators. Excellent. Thank you, Zach. All right, Amy. A rot in a spot. A rot in a spot, of course. So I brought some pepper leaves today. These are actually from my own garden. And what I'm showing today, this is bacterial spot of pepper. Um, this is the time of year we start seeing it. This is a bacterial disease. And actually, these plants were bought from a local greenhouse. And they looked fine when I bought them. And the reason why I know it's not from my garden space is because there's never been peppers in this spot of my garden ever. It was a cattle yard. So it most likely came in on the plant material, and it's only when temperatures get above 85 degrees that we start seeing the symptomology show up. So we get these watermark, our water-soaked lesions that then slowly progress into this brown necrotic area, and it will slowly end up killing and dying, um, killing those leaf tissue areas. You'll see yellowing and wilting of the plant. So what do you do about it? The best thing to do is go ahead and pinch those leaves off and dispose of them. The reason why you want to dispose of them and not compost them is this bacterial disease will also go to tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And so if you're rotating and you think, oh, if I had peppers here this year, I'll put tomatoes, it's going to infect your tomatoes and then it just ends up being this really big vicious cycle. Um, so it's just a bacterial disease. Pinch off the leaves. It can also affect the fruit. You can get some blotching on the fruit. Uh, it, plants most likely will not produce as many peppers as normal because of the lack of photosynthesis area on that plant material. But that's about your only option. And if you're in the greenhouse, you've had some hail events, and you're going back to the greenhouse and buying those really cheap peppers, 
be looking for this because right now in the greenhouses you'll definitely see it on those greenhouse plants make sure you pick those healthy ones to put put back in your garden as replacement after those hail events excellent thanks amy all right sarah let's see you taste one <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah everybody's daring me to taste one of these gooseberries on camera i've never actually tasted a gooseberry before so uh, i'm not sure if i'm going to do that well while you all are watching me. <laughs> but gooseberry is a great summer fruit and we usually harvest these in June, about this time of year. Uh, we had a question earlier in the season from a viewer about gooseberries and they, they said that their plants were not producing and uh, wondered why. And so I wanted to come back to that a little bit tonight um, and talk about that. Gooseberries are one of those plants that bloom very early in the spring, kind of like peaches do. And so they're very susceptible to um, late spring freezes that can kill the flowers. So if you're having trouble with gooseberries not blooming, one of the reasons could be that your flowers have died uh, from cold winter temperatures or from late spring freezes. So the ideal spot for gooseberries in a landscape would be like a northern exposure or a northern facing slope, someplace where the land is going to warm up a little slower in the spring and that can make them a little bit suscept less susceptible to the late spring frosts. The other thing you can think about with gooseberries is that even though they are self-fruitful or self-pollinating, they will produce better if you have a pollinator. So instead of having just one bush, if you have you know three or five and maybe have a couple of different cultivars together, you'll get more harvest and bigger fruits. The other thing to think about then is just maintenance. As a gooseberry plant gets older, you do need to do regular pruning so that you keep the stems young because the younger stems will produce better. So once a plant's about three years old, you want to start pruning out the oldest canes uh, and leaving the younger ones and having a, a maximum of about 10 to 12 stems per plant. And so do that pruning, um, do that pruning in the fall uh, or excuse me, you could do it in the fall, but probably the better time would be in March, just before the season starts again. And um, that will keep the stems nice and young and, and producing very well. Uh, right. So hopefully that will help with all the gooseberry questions out there. Great. Mm -hmm. Dare you. Double dare. Eat on. Eat on. Eat on. <laughs> all right, Jim, you get the first picture question. We'll beat up on Sarah later about that. Uh, your first picture is very cool. I think our audience can mm -hmm. probably see those bright orange eggs. Mm -hmm. And this is a Hickman viewer, and those are on the potatoes. Potato. Okay. Um, I, you know, this is a good question. When you're a gardener and you see a, an egg mass that's kind of yellowish or yellowish orange, there's a question that pops up. Is this a beneficial uh, lady beetle egg mass or is this a pest? In this case, uh, this is Colorado potato beetle and egg mass there. And they, they tend to be much larger, a little more orangish. So I'd say if you just have a very limited planting, just you got your gloves on, just go ahead and smoosh it uh, or remove the leaves. Um, if it turns out you have an extensive planting, you can't do it manually like that, then you can try something like as soon as the larvae hatched out, you know, you can try an insecticidal soap or you can try carbaryl. Um, again, it all depends on just how much defoliation is occurring. If it's just patchy here and there, don't necessarily worry about it. You don't have to do anything about it. Uh, a number of the beneficials might even take care of it, in fact. Excellent. Thanks, If it's Jim. not smooshed. Yeah, if it's not <laughs> smooshed. Nobody wants anything that's smooshed. No. No. All right, you get a weed in native prairie question for your first picture since you're planting a native prairie. And this is uh, a viewer who did, who did plant last year in a bean field, mowed to keep the weeds low uh, a lot. Now the prairie has what he thinks is prickly lettuce and mare's tail. Mm -hmm. And he knows they're annuals. Should he mow them down? He's going to burn next year. He says Roundup is not exactly practical in this situation. Pass. No. <laughs> so, so whenever, whenever we mix uh, wildflowers of broadleaf uh, desirable with uh, des desirable grasses, it really limits uh, a herbicide that's really easy to have either a turf set stand or a broadleaf uh, uh, a forb stand because you have a, a better selection of herbicides. In this particular case, the natives are they're wonderful. I just planted a bunch of them. They're fabulous. Uh, hindsight's 2020, but normally we would like to plant the grasses the first year. And I think you were using a, a prairie mix from right. uh, three, uh, four actually it's a four species prairie mix. Get that established. Keep the weeds down by mowing uh, and maybe a little bit of herbicide use, and then come in uh, the following year and introduce the the uh, the forbs. 
that's hindsight, that's, that's down the road. So on a small setting, you go in and, and cut them out, you could spray Roundup, uh, a spot spray Roundup, you could use a weed eater on the larger, the larger weeds or the, the larger patches, but unfortunately there's really no good effective broadcast spray that you're gonna be able to take over the top of that. Uh, you know, a prairie setting, we might go in at the, in the fall with Roundup and take out all the broadleaf and, and cool season grasses, but it will also probably hurt your, your forbs. And so mm -hmm. you, could, you could try a herbicide called Plateau, which has a pretty broad spectrum of both safety and control. Uh, it's really iffy because it has lots of different precautions on the label. And the problem with that one, it has neither mare's tail or prickly lettuce, which what, is what they had in that. Right. In that. And so uh, we don't have any answers. The burning is gonna help a lot. Burning will help fabulous. It'll, and what I would say, if you have large patches of it, I would go in and mow it out right now. Uh, otherwise, wait, uh, cut out individual plants, spray individual plants, uh, burn it next spring. Patience. Patience is a virtue. It's just really difficult. It's, that's why I established only grasses, being the grass guy, because it's really hard to do the forbs no matter what my current wife says. She <laughs> wants she wanted the grasses in there. We'll get them later, but not now. All right. Okay, Amy, uh, this is a Stewart viewer who mm -hmm. wants to know what this is. That is beautiful common smut on sweet corn. Um, very common. We're actually probably going to see a lot of it. Uh, common smut is a fungal disease that enters in whenever we have a wound, and we've been having hailstorm upon hailstorm upon hailstorm. So it will develop on the ear. It will develop on the tassel. It will develop on the stalk itself. There isn't anything you can do. You can pop it off. Before it gets too big, this is actually a little too big. It's actually considered a delicacy, and you can eat it. Um, <laughs> which Rock has done on air. <laughs> which Rock has done on air. I've tried it once. It isn't bad. It's like any other mushroom, but you want it before it starts. You see that big black mass of spores. Um, just kind of like a puffball after a puffball explodes. You don't want to eat those either. Yep. Exact same thing with common smut. Um, so you can just pop it off and... Go ahead and eat that sweet corn, or you can take your knife and cut it out, and you'll be just fine. But it, it's a pretty good indication exactly where those hailstones hit. And I know in the Stewart area, we had that big hailstorm back in June 2nd. Um, we're going to still see some common smut development even at this point in time from, you know, a month ago because that corn was still developing. Mm. And right. wherever it hit, it's going to come in. Thanks, Amy. Sarah, this is also a wildflower question. It's a Fremont viewer who found a couple of things growing by a lake, and she simply wants an ID. Well, the yellow flowers are uh, called bird's foot trefoil, and this is a, a very low-growing plant. You commonly see it along the roadsides, and it stays very low to the ground. The purple flowers, which were a little harder to see in the picture, was crown vetch, and um, crown vetch will get taller. Uh, in fact, when it grows up against something, it'll, it'll tend to kind of grow up. But in a, in a stand all by itself, it'll be, oh, usually about a foot and a half to two feet tall, somewhere in there. Um, so if you wanted these plants in your landscape for kind of a, a wildflower area, a, a place that doesn't need to be manicured really well, uh, they, they would be an option. Um, although I think the crown vetch would eventually take over the uh, bird's foot trefoil because crown vetch is, is pretty aggressive. Um, okay, Jim, uh, I, your next picture is of an insect that has a pile of questions larger than my table. Yes, I can expect that. This guy, um, what is it? Okay, it's a cicada killer wasp, and uh, a lot of people are alarmed by them because they know they're a wasp, and they're huge in their minds, and they think they sting, but cicada killers are valuable in, you know, helping to suppress cicada populations, and we've had a lot of cicadas over the last year especially, so we're going to have more cicada killers this summer as well. Uh, they have these ritual flights, you know, where they're the males, you know, they, they kind of jerk their eyes around like this, like that, and they land in the same place, and uh, they have these ritual dances, and it's not that they're alarmed that you're there, their mind is on something else, and they're looking for a female <laughs> to fly by, and then, of course, they'll, they'll fly off with her. Uh, so don't be alarmed by that. If they're not in a flight path where you're walking or a doorway or something like that, you know, just enjoy them. If you have to suppress their activity in some place, just apply, you know, wet down that soil or that bank or that dry area where they tend to, to favor digging. Wet it down really good and keep it wet. That'll discourage them. Or if you have to use a granular insecticide as a last resort, you know, carbaryl or permethrin. But. 
Okay. How did they move their head again? It's just kind of like, you know, they're, you know. <laughs> and do, and do they, what kind of dance is it then that they do? It's just a ritual okay. flight. <laughs> it looks like a robot dance. <laughs> yeah, okay. And on that note. Moving on. <laughs> uh, this is appropriate for prairie management. Okay. Zach, this is a, uh, a viewer oh, who had cool. said this came up in their yard and it was sown to native grasses three years ago. This is near Firth. What is it, and should they rogue it out or keep yeah, it? That's, uh, that's common mullen, and that's in its second year. It's a, it's a biennial, so the first year it forms a rosette, and then the second year it throws a giant seed head. And uh, yeah, you can, you can rogue it out. I think they're kind of interesting. Uh, you see them here and there. I don't, I've never seen a huge patch of it that really become much of a problem, but you know, depending on how long they've been there and what kind of, you know, uh, how old they get and you know, how dense the patch is. Rogue it out. You, uh, since it's biennial, you could probably control it in the fall of the year. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll control the rosette and prevent the seed heads from, from, uh, uh, from forming. So any uh, three-way herbicide applied in the fall of the year would, would probably take that out and prevent the seed head the next year. All right. Thank you, sir. I still think they're cool, though. <laughs> Amy, you have a couple of peony questions. Mm -hmm. and we have had a lot this year. Um, one is a bit spotty, and the other one is a bit white. And both of these viewers, they're older plants, and they're wondering what the issues are and what can be done about them. All right. We'll start with the picture that's up right now, the one with the white growth. growth. Um, this is powdery mildew. We're starting to see it show up. We're starting to get higher humidities. Um, not a lot you can do. Typically, I don't recommend a lot of treatments for powdery mildew. Blasting it with water definitely helps because it doesn't like free water. Uh, you might want to look at pruning it out, trying to increase air circulations will help. Um, push comes to shove. If you start seeing some decline, you can treat it with a general fungicide. Now, the previous picture with the spots, that is a fungal leaf spot. Uh, typically, it's really only seen when we're, we have a lot of cool, wet weather. As we start getting into the warmer temperatures, because I, I believe next week we're supposed to be predicted back up into the 90s, you'll actually see um, disease development slow down tremendously on that one. Uh, at this point in time, there isn't a lot I would recommend. Uh, most of the time we're going to be looking at a preventative fungicide application. If you're making fungicide applications to control your botrytis, botrytis blight, it will also control that fungal disease on those leaves also. Once again, avoid overhead irrigation. Prune out to try to make sure we have good air circulation in there uh, would also help with that situation. All right. Thank you, Amy. Sarah, this is a viewer that uh, has Asiatic, Asiatic lilies, and they, and they began dying out a bit. Um, there was some thought that it was maybe a stock board, Jim, but apparently they've had a couple of people tell them that it is not. Mm -hmm. So their question, you know, is it, is it too much what, what, what is it mm -hmm. exactly with this? Well, there's something going wrong with the bulb, uh, for sure. So there are some bulb rots that, that could cause this yellowing of the foliage like this. Um, there are possibly some other causes, too. So what I would do is, uh, that plant is, is going to die. So what I would do is I'd pull it out and examine the bulb. And if it's one of the fungal rots, it could be soft and it could smell bad or just be kind of dried or kind of uh, punky almost. Um, if that's the case, then it would be best if you rogued out the dying plants and then not plant lilies back there for about f five or six years uh, and let those uh, disease spores die down. You might also, when you pull that out, you might find some uh, damage. Maybe there's been some voles feeding on the bulbs or, or uh, something like that. And so if, if it's a wildlife problem, then you're going to need to try to control the, the voles. Um, it could also be just, you know, something like overwatering. If that is a wet spot, and overwatering can also promote some of the bulb rots. So uh, if that's the cause, then definitely let those areas dry out more. Uh, but still, you're probably going to have to give a few years at least before those pathogens to die down in the soil before you'll have good success with your lilies in that spot again. Okay, uh, Jim, you have a question from Omaha. This is a viewer that has red ants with wings near the landscape timbers, hundreds crawling and flying. What to do? My guess is this is the time for field ants to be swarming. And those are the ones that make nests in the soil. They're kind of frothy. Uh, you know, they heap up their, the, the soil or whatever when they make their nests. So it seems kind of soft and frothy there. That those, you know, every ant, species has to swarm at some time and there's this these field ants swarm in midsummer and that we call them red ants locally but they're a field ant and they're very beneficial so I just let them go ahead and do their thing they're going to disperse to other locations um, so 
really nothing to worry about. All right, thanks, Jim. Zach, this is a Southeast Nebraska viewer that has fescue. It says that the turf is turning brown around the trees in patches, but the crown apparently is still there. Yeah, I assume it's, uh, it would be turf, it'd be turf type tall fescue when you say fescue. Uh, boy, around the trees, I would be surprised with, because uh, turf like tall fescue of, of the grasses are pretty tolerant to shade, uh, and the, you know, unless it's a walnut tree. Send us a picture. Yeah, that might maybe a picture, uh, a sample would be uh, would be useful. But okay. uh, turf type tall fescue is pretty bullet bulletproof, so that's why I'm surprised. It might be, you know, if it's not turf type tall fescue, then it, a whole, there's a whole different, uh, could be a whole different answer. Okay, all right. Amy, we've had a lot of questions about hawthorn rust. Mm -hmm. This particular viewer knows they have it because they've had it before. They're wondering about the optimal spray window for controlling it. Uh, to prevent hawthorn rust, your best time is actually in the spring in bud. Uh, leaf emergence is when you're gonna spray because that's when the plants are infected, um, most generally. Otherwise, the next big thing is when you start seeing those tendrils, those orange aliens coming out of the cedar trees, that's also another great indication that's time to spray because that's the spores are coming from the cedars over to your hawthorn, quince, apple, um, any of those species. So and is it a multiple spray program? Was this it depends on the year. Okay. This year, since we had so much rain, it was definitely a two-year program. Now, if you compared it to 12 and 13, it was a one-year. And actually, 12, you could have gone away, it was zero because we didn't have enough moisture. All right, thanks, Amy. Sarah, this is a Saunders County viewer who wonders if you can can, and I assume they're meaning pickle, burpless cucumbers. Uh, yes, you sure can. I should yeah, have saved that no for a lightning that, round. Yeah, there's no reason they can't. Yeah. <laughs> so I would assume that yeah. that simply means that when you eat your pickles, you're not gonna burp. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You Ready? Got? Ready to go. We've had record lows in a lot of the states. Are they going to affect tomato fruiting? Um, possibly. I mean, some of the 50 degree nights that we had are pretty cold for pollination of tomato flowers, but um, I don't think it'll be too big of a interruption. All right. Why are this person's Orient Express cucumbers hollow in the middle? What causes cukes to be hollow? Well, if the seeds don't form properly, then you don't get the center of the cucumber forming properly. So I'm thinking pollination issues probably. All right. This viewer wants to know if they can spray Tordon on the cut suckers of a tree without hurting the original tree. Definitely not. You will kill the tree. All right. This one has tomatoes that apparently are way too happy and they're trailing all over the place. Can they be pinched or pruned or will that cause trouble? You could pinch the suckers in the, the axles of the leaf and the stalk, but that's not going to hasten the development of tomatoes. All right. How can this viewer tell when their Vidalia onions are ready to harvest? You kind of look at the tops, at the, you know, where the leaves go into the ground to see that bulb development. Uh, if, you know, you can also just harvest a couple and just see if they're getting to the right size that you're looking for. Excellent. Oh, nice job, bad. Sarah. Bad. You ready, Amy? <laughs> yeah. One from Give a shot. We had a viewer from Norfolk send a picture of a round, puffy <laughs> thing in a pot. Would that be a fungus of some sort? It wasn't an insect. It's probably a fungus of some sort. Which one? I have no idea. And to eat it? <laughs> I would advise not. I would advise not. Um, unless you have proper identification. All right. We have another viewer who said they're getting really mushy brown foliage on their tomatoes, almost gelatinous when they touch it. Uh, that could be a bacterial disease going in there, um, but also some of the fungal diseases that cause stem and canker rot will get mushy like that also. Probably also a place where you had a wound of some sort, a uh, high wind or hail event. All right. We had somebody uh, say they found a round white thing like a snake ed egg buried in the ground and they cut it open and it was kind of like an egg. What is it? That would be a baby stink horn. Okay. Will heirloom beans get the rust diseases more than regular old beans? The heirlooms are going to be a lot more susceptible because they have no resistance in them. All right. Have you ever seen canker on the stems of gooseberry bushes? I have not, but I wouldn't be surprised that it develops a canker. Excellent. Nice job. You ready, Zach? One, two, three, go. <laughs> we have a viewer who wants to overseed this fall, but they have wood sorrel and violets all over the yard. What do they do about that? Uh, wood sorrel shouldn't be a problem, but the violets will be a problem. I would go ahead and seed now and the, or in the first week of August and then control the violets in October. All right. Um, you're supposed to irrigate when the grass turns blue or the footprints stay in it. Is 
that old wives or does that work? Perfect. Okay. <laughs> keep it dry. Keep it on the dry side. We overwater turf. All right. How do you control black medic in a lawn? And this is from Ainsworth. Uh, black medic is usually a perennial around here, so a fall application, a mohai, and all of the cultural things, and then uh, an application of a three-way herbicide in, in the fall. Okay. Um, when do you aerate in time for fall seeding? Uh, I would, in time for fall, if you're going to combine it with seeding, I would do it the same day that you seed. So uh, late August, first uh, Labor Day weekend would be fabulous. Okay. And, and how wet or how far in advance of that should you irrigate to make sure the tines go in? Uh, to, uh, you might not have to with the rains, and so you just, you just want to make sure, you know, a day or two ahead of time to make sure the tines can get in. Excellent. Nice job. Good job, all. You ready, Jim? Mm -hmm. Okay, we have something on the maples that is hopping about and forming honeydew. What is that? I think they're probably some kind of a, a leaf hopper. I'm um, not familiar with what kind, but leaf hoppers do that. Aphids as well. All right. Do those little bitty lace bugs uh, damage the oaks, those little black ones? Yeah, they can damage them pretty severely. Uh, uh, fortunately for large oaks like the burr oaks, uh, they sustain it pretty well even though they may turn bronzy brown. Okay, so nothing you can really do about that. Mm, small trees you can treat it with some kind of insecticide with plenty of turbulence as you spray. Okay, do the stalk borer things attack hardy hibiscus? Uh, it seems like it's out of the season for that, um, possibly, but stock borers occur earlier in the season, so I'm thinking something else. Okay, we have a viewer who says their grape leaves were skeletonized, but it wasn't Japanese beetles. It was a grayish winged insect. Ooh, uh, let's see. There's a, a grape leaf skeletonizer. Um, <laughs> you know what? I think maybe it's a, a ash gray blister beetle because they'll do that too. They love grapes and beans and whatever. I think you just made that up. <laughs> Which Duh. one? Which one did I make up? Skeleton. Most of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Wait, Sarah. The grape leaf skeleton. skeleton. There, there is a grape leaf yeah, skeleton. No, I've heard of skeleton. Yeah, but it's a tiny That's little thing. Sure, Jim, sure. Yeah. Huh? Okay. <laughs> okay, Sarah, what has Gladys brought us today? So two more beautiful flowers from Gladys uh, this week. And we'll, we'll take a look first at this, this purple one, beautiful purple flower. This one has a lot of different names. Um, Prairie gentian, uh, Eustoma, Lysianthus, Texas bluebell, lots of names. Um, uh, Lysianthus is actually the genus name. Eustoma is an old genus name, uh, but call it whatever you like. It's a beautiful flower. Makes a great cut flower. It lasts in vases for quite a long time. So if you'd like to have some you know, plants you can cut and bring indoors, this would be a great one. Um, if you like to grow your own transplants, Lysianthus is one that you can grow, but it's kind of slow as, as a transplant. You have to give that uh, quite a long time, sometimes 12 weeks or more to develop a good transplant. So you, you need to start this one back in January if you plan to plant it in May. Um, gets to be about two, two or a little bit taller than two feet tall. Um, the genus is kind of varied because there are some perennials, there are some annuals, there are some biennials. So you kind of get the whole mix in, in this particular genus. But great cut flowers and beautiful in the garden too. Uh, the little red flowers that we have here are uh, in a genus called Kufia. And this, this particular genus has a lot of different species in it. They are subtropical, so these are not hardy in Nebraska. We grow these primarily as annuals here. This one is called cigar flower and um, uh, likes warm, sunny conditions, gets about 16 inches, 18 inches tall, something like that, with these uh, beautiful little red, kind of shaded with purple flowers. And um, so that's cigar flower. So as always, she's brought us a beautiful combination. Yes. And when I am older, I'm going to wear red with purple. <laughs> Just so you know. Mm -hmm. Older. Okay, you get the next one, Jim, right. which is a beautiful picture that got sent in from Council Bluffs. They want to know what is the name of this interesting okay. moth. That's uh, called an imperial moth. It's in the same family as a cecropia moth and a polyphemus, but obviously much different in color. Very pretty with those tan, light brown colors and yellows. And it's distributed east of the Rocky Mountains all the way to the Atlantic coast, but we don't see it that often mm -hmm. here. So I think that's a real uh, special observation there to see mm -hmm. one. And because they're active at night as well. So imperial moths, as caterpillars are kind of horny and green, 
just like cecropias would be, and they feed on a wide variety of trees and shrubs, and so they have it made, but they just, they don't have, they're not as populated as cecropia moths, but they're around and they're a real treat to see. <laughs> Excellent, thank you, Jim. And you must be anticipating your picture. I'm guessing. I'm just <laughs> hoping it's going to be. It's the only one I know. <laughs> this is a viewer who said they have this particular grassy weed that has populated their garden, and they're afraid they're seeing it in their turf. Yes, they are. They're probably seeing it both places, and it's uh, yellow foxtail, which is a very, uh, very common. Uh, annual grass, very similar to crabgrass. A little bit more difficult to cr control than crabgrass, and I brought a, I brought a sample. This is uh, one of the award-winning samples that we had outside Kime Hall tonight. And uh, <laughs> you can tell it by the, by the, the seed head, really uh, characteristic seed head. And it is a warm season annual, so it's just like crabgrass germinates, just a smidge later than crabgrass, I believe. <gasps> Best way to control this is with good cultural practices, mowing high and, and uh, uh, irrigating and keeping stress off the lawn. And if that doesn't work, a pre-emergent herbicide applied in the, uh, in around here, probably late April, maybe a second application, uh, first week of June, will uh, do a really nice job of this. Excellent. So for those uh, viewers who think that's one of the ornamental grasses, not so much. You could pass it off as an ornamental grass. Right. Actually, it was in an ornamental grass bed. I know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, Amy, this is a, a St. Edward viewer okay. who has both pumpkins and peppers that have foliage that looks like that. All right. The pepper is the exact same disease that I brought in at the beginning of the show, a bacterial, bacterial spot. We just remove the, remove the leaves and dispose of them. There isn't a lot you can do. The pumpkin, on the other hand, this is a fungal disease called scab. Um, once again, favors cool, wet weather. It will also affect the fruit itself. So the fruit will end up with the, as the name applies, scab. Some of these scabby, callousy uh, formations on the fruit itself. For pumpkins, uh, depending on how you're planning on selling them or using them, if they're using them as jack-o'-lanterns, I say it's a new marketing tool that makes them more <laughs> wartier and more appealing to be an ugly jack-o'-lantern. Uh, you want to use sanitation to manage this one, avoid overhead irrigation whenever possible. Putting that mulch bed down will also help prevent the spores from going from the soil onto the leaves and onto the fruit itself. All right, and should he try to rotate? A rotation is always a wonderful okay. thing. All right, thank you, Amy. Sarah, we don't know where this particular viewer is from, but uh, she has sent some images of a what is this tree? And I think there are two or three there for us to kind of take a look at. Yeah. Well, we think this is a polonia, royal polonia is called. And um, this is a tree that grows from seed. Um, it's not the best tree for Nebraska. It tends to grow very fast and have soft wood. Um, it's sold in the papers. Sometimes you'll see ads for this in the Sunday Circular, and they'll have all these great claims, and it, it has beautiful purple flowers. But unfortunately, the, the flowers are, are very seldom ever winter hardy in Nebraska, so we hardly ever see it bloom. And sometimes we'll have a severe enough winter where the whole tree dies to the crown and then grows back up again. So it's generally not considered an excellent tree for, for us just, just because of those hardiness issues. Excellent. Uh, this is a hackberry issue. Uh, again, we don't know where it is, but they can be ugly ducklings anyway, and this is really ugly duckling. What is that? Well, it's a combination of things. You know, um, hackberry nipple gall is a very common uh, colonizer, you might say, of hackberry historically. And uh, so that's what all the wartiness is there. Now, some of those holes in the leaves are actually caused by the adults in the springtime when the leaves are just coming out. They feed on the leaves and they create little teeny little dead spots or holes. And so, and then also when they implant the, their eggs or whatever for the nipple galls to form, some of those don't make it. And so you have these, these holes that kind of fall out, you might say, that the tissue falls out. So that's part of it. But I think hackberry as a rule, when you look at it, they're not all perfectly complete and entire. Uh, it always seems like there's, there's gaps or holes somewhere that has, is related to the growth or development of the leaf. And uh, I don't know, I guess a common term is leaf tatters. Linden does that quite frequently mm -hmm. too. Yeah, but you know, sometimes we see that in the early spring. If we get late freezes, it kills mm -hmm. the tissue of the leaf as it's emerging and then they come out and they look all ragged and tattered. Yeah. Pre, so. pre does, pre-damaged or whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Imperfect, but it doesn't seem as to, are the rest of us. Yeah, it doesn't seem, you know, it doesn't <laughs> seem to affect the health of the trees, yeah. especially yeah. if they're medium to, to large size, so. Right, yeah. just look the other direction. Yeah. 
Okay, we have for you, Zach, a Humboldt viewer who has sent us an image of a weed and she says she's never seen it before, but she's finding it everywhere. She can pull it out, but she does kind of wonder what it is. Yeah, I'm not, we're not quite sure what that is. Uh, the guesses slash educated, uh, the, the authorities would say uh, pokeweed or uh, uh, maybe it's some kind of a knotweed. Uh, somewhere I think it's in the Polygonaceae family. And so it's, it's an annual, it does form lots of seeds, so I would continue to, I would continue to pull those out. I assume it's in, your, uh, in a bed somewhere, so I would continue to pull those out. Uh, probably the most effective way to control that. If you don't pull them out, they'll form seeds, and that problem will continue. It's a good year to see all sorts of things. Lots of, there's lots of moisture, so a lot of those seeds are continuing to grow without mm -hmm. that, that wouldn't normally grow in, in beds and lawns. And Mm -hmm. Amy, you have about five questions about fire blight in mm -hmm. pears, and you have a couple pictures here that are apple with that one kind of looking fire blighty, and yep. then another apple issue from a different viewer. Do you want to talk about those diseases? All right. Fire blight is a bacterial disease that's actually transmitted by the honeybees uh, when they're pollinating oh. earlier in the spring. And the honeybees are just a carrier for it. Uh, the honeybees are attracted to the the ooze that comes out because it has a lot of sugars in it and that's how they move the bacteria. So it comes in through the flower and then it's gonna move down that stem and then it ends up killing the tissue itself. You'll also see canker development associated with it. Um, cool wet weather also helps promote it a little bit. The only way you can manage it really is to prune back those affected areas. And since it's a bacterial disease, we're gonna tell you to prune back at least eight inches from where the um, visible symptoms are at. That way we're getting past that bacterial zone and usually it, um, you can cut it out. The other trick is every time you make a cut that pruners needs to be disinfected either with bleach or um, uh, isopropyl alcohol, anything like that before you make another cut. That way you're not moving the bacteria from one cut to the next. Uh, it's just been a great year for fire blight this year. Um, you just something you have to learn to deal with. There are definitely some varieties that are a lot more resistant to fire blight than some of the ones that we're more familiar with. Bradford pear is a very susceptible host uh, for fire blight. So the other one was was that cedar apple rust or scab that the apples that are dropping all their foliage. Uh, dropping all their foliage, yeah, that's scab coming in. If they're dropping this early though, I, I was suspect that there's something else going on. There's another stress to that tree. I would be looking for cankers. Maybe it's being too wet. Um, typically we don't see leaf drop due to apple scab until about middle of August. So it's about a month early. So I'd probably be concerned about some other issues with that tree. Like so take a look. For, like looking for woolly bears just in case winter's early. Yes. <laughs> okay, Sarah, your last picture is, uh, this is a viewer in Western Oto County. They have 13 pines, about 10 years old. They're wondering, is this pine wilt? And we threw it to you because of the windbreak issues mm -hmm. more than the wilt and insect issues. This, this doesn't look like pine wilt because on a pine wilt tree, you're not gonna see what we have in the picture here where you have dying needles, but you also have nice, green, healthy looking needles. So usually when a tree dies from pine wilt, the, the whole tree, the old growth and the new growth, all goes off color at one time. Mm -hmm. So this is looking more just like classical stress to me. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be drought stress. We've certainly had you know, two terrible drought years followed by a very, very dry winter. Um, and it could be that you know, this tree is having had some root issues that's en enhancing the drought problems by not being able to pull up water as well as maybe other trees in the windbreak. Um, so I don't think there's anything directly you can do as far as you know, fungicides or anything like that. But if you have the ability to water, if it's been dry in your area, um, then I, if, if it stays dry for the rest of the summer, it might not be a bad idea to, to water this tree a few times, some good deep soakings, and see if it can pull out of this. All right, thank you, Sarah. Well, we have a couple of announcements of fun things going on in the gardening world, beginning with the Greater Omaha Iris Society sale, July 25th, 2 to 8, St. Andrews, with both a number and a uh, URL on the screen for that one. It is iris planting time. The second one is Lincoln with their rhizome sale, which is August 2nd, and again, a number on the screen for that. And uh, the iris officiandos are ready to go on that. I know the, the collection on campus, I believe, got moved yesterday. All right, so Jim, this is a, let's see, let's do, well, they're both the same. Mm. So ground wasps.
from two different parts of the state. They're calling them ground wasps. What to do about them in the yard? Okay, yeah. See, see in this part of the state, that would be the cicada killers. Uh, in the western part of the state, there's other kinds of wasps called sand wasps that actually attack uh, cricket nymp or uh, grasshopper nymphs and drag them into their, their nests. So uh, in either case, uh, there's really tough to do. Like, you can't really overwater out west. You can do some watering here to discourage uh, digging on this side of the state because the soils are heavier. Um, but again, a granular formulation if you have to, a granular formulation of some insecticide like permethrin or carbaryl um, will also discourage that kind of activity too. Um, they're usually very busy and distracted. They're not really aggressive at all. In fact, you can sit and watch them and it's really fascinating to see what they do. So just because they're there, there doesn't mean that they have to be controlled. All right, thank you, Jim. We have a handful of how do we control the clover, one of them being uh, from Mitchell, and it's in a lawn in, rural, in, in a rural Sioux County area. The other is that they have tried 2,4-D and it doesn't kill it, and the yep. third is sweet clover, yellow yep. clover. Yeah, the, uh, the clover, uh, with the exception, well, sweet clover is a biennial, but uh, uh, typical white clover you see in lawns is a, is a perennial, and so it's an indication in most cases that it's you're low in nitrogen it's a legume and so uh, applying just a little bit more nitrogen in the uh, usually in the fall in a cool season grass if it's a warm season grass like buffalo oil a little bit more nitrogen in the in the summer uh, so that's the first thing to do if you choose to use a herbicide uh, 2,4-D is not the answer it's really ineffective on on, uh, on the clovers so I would use uh, dicamba or uh, uh, MCPP or MCPA that's why we have when, we, when I talk about a three-way herbicide that's why we have three in there because or three active ingredients because sometimes one or maybe two are not as effective and so fertilizer uh, three-way herbicide applied in September or October all right or let it be or, or, or let or yeah that's your choice they went yeah. right in if if, uh, if that's your trip that was their choice however that's true Amy this is yet again a, a, a Hawthorne question we're mm -hmm. about out of time but they're wanting to know whether they should cut the infected berries off before they start dropping the rust or other sanitation practices for hawthorn. Actually, you can just leave them there because the spores that are being produced on that hawthorn are not going to reinfect that hawthorn. Those are only going to go to cedar, and the spores from the cedar trees are the only ones that can affect the hawthorn. So they're perfectly fine right there. Uh, saves you a lot of hassle. <laughs> it's a lot of fruit to cut. Yes. And Sarah, again, we're almost out of time, but this is a viewer who found what they thought looked like little berries on the top of their potatoes, mm -hmm. and, and they think they're poisonous, and, and they, they're wondering what, what are those, and are they poisonous? That's the actual uh, natural fruiting structure of potatoes. You know, the potato that we eat is not the fruit. It's a root section. So this is the berry or the fruit structure. They are not edible. Um, some cultivars develop them more, and, which, and Yukon Gold is one of those that develops them quite often. Right. Are mm -hmm. they poisonous? Um, I don't, don't know that. Them. I don't know that, but they're not considered edible. All right. Thanks, Sarah.